like you just don't care. All right. All right. Excellent, excellent. Jenny, tell us some things why you love our church, both this campus as well as our North Campus. Um, I love I love the people. Honestly, like, you guys are family. And if you haven't been coming here long enough to realize that we are one big family, that's what we are. And so you guys are what makes it so precious here, just in the love of Jesus Christ. I love this guy over here. I'm pretty happy he's our pastor. <laughs> Um, I love that we have a that we have that we have a pastor who fiercely guards his sheep, his flock. Um, that means the world, and that you you speak the word of God with authority and with power. And so that's that's another reason. I know I'm going rogue. Sorry, um, um, but no, the, the people is the people are what makes it here. Um, just in the presence of the Lord, I love that we have a north and a south campus combined as one. Um, if you haven't visited North before, please do, because they are just as much of a family, part of this family as this big group here, and we're all together. Um, I love that we stick to a vision of reaching the lost and discipling the found, that we're living that vision, and also that we're a multi-generational church. We have infants all the way up to, I, I'm not going to ask who's the oldest here, but we have every generation present at Freedom Church, and every generation is so important in raising up the next generation, and you still have a message no matter what generation you are, so I love that. Amen. Amen. Well, it's our pleasure this morning to share with you some vision going forward in this season for the church. And, and we do this about twice a year. We do it in the fall time right now. We also like to do it in January as well. Scripture says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. See, there's plenty of things in life that you don't want to do. But there's one thing that you really, really, really don't want to do. And what is that? Perish. None of us want to perish, right? You just don't want to. It's not, not a fun day, right? Nobody wants to perish. The, the word actually means to let go. And not in a surrendering way, by the way, but in a careless kind of way. The idea is that you cast off restraint in your life, and ultimately, you take yourself outside the covering of God, meaning you step outside of His authority and His care for your life by doing it your own way, when you start to live without any vision. Because the visionary for all of us and the vision for our lives, for all of humanity, should be God. But often we turn to other things. And when we turn to other things, you ultimately perish. Your quality of life, your spiritual, physical, mental, even emotional life, they begin to fade away. I would say vision is extremely important in life. And if you don't, if you don't have vision for your life, it's time to go get it. Amen? Amen. We're talking about this vision in the last week of this series, Go Get It. And listen, we have five sensory inputs. What are those, Jenny? What are five sensory inputs? Is this a science question? Yes. Okay. You're a nurse. Um, our eyes. Eyes. I like those glasses. You like PC and glasses? All right. Salve <laughs> with me. All right. Just. Our ears. Our ears. Ears. Um, touch. Touch. Um, our tongue. Tasting. Taste. And, oh. Sniffing. Sniffing. All right. All right. Hopefully those are all in good order for us, okay? But out of these five, guess which one contributes to 80% of your brain learning or gaining knowledge? Uh, I wish it was the mouth, but actually your eyes. It's your eyes. Vision. That's right. What you see transfers to what you know. And this fact led to A.M. Skevington, a, a renowned optometrist, to, to say, if a person cannot see 100%, they cannot be 100%. You see, the brain or your core processing system and all of its synapses with it are constantly communicating and deciphering not only our own movements, 
but also what is right in front of you so that you can adapt and kind of respond to the environment and the atmosphere of which you are placed in and perceiving your surroundings. Vision, it keeps you safe. It keeps you moving. It keeps you focused on the target because it's really, really easy to get out of focus and start going after wrong vision in your life. And to be quite honest, we're living this way right now, even in our nation. Really, if we want to be honest, there's really a lack of genuine, healthy vision. And we see some things perishing in our nation. There's a lack of righteousness and a godliness, a lack of accountability, which only leads to the greater fraying of the fabric of society. And church, we can't be on the sidelines. We can't be spectators. Now is not the time to, to sit down. It's the time to stand up. Stand up for righteousness and bring light into darkness and, and the confusion that's out there. That's how we're called to live as the church, amen. It's time to stand up. It's time to stand up for the sacredness of life and, and family. It's time to stand up against greed and corruption. It's time to, to stand up against the ideological warfare that's actually coming against the Judeo-Christian values of this nation. It's time for the church to humble herself, though, and pray and seek the face of God turning from our own wickedness so that he would heal our land. It's time to have a vision for the kingdom of Jesus Christ beyond just coming to church on a Sunday. Can I get a big amen for that? Amen. Listen, the word for church in the New Testament is ecclesia, which means the called out ones. We're called out of the world by God to be different in how we live in relationship to Jesus. And yet at the same time, we're called to go back into the world to share the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Either way, we're to be a people that never loses sight of the vision of Jesus. And that is this, to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's what Jesus said. Jesus' vision is the world. And so that's got to be our vision too, to share the gospel to everyone everywhere, not to, not to browbeat, not to, not, to, not to just push it on there, not, not to just bang people over the top of the heads with the gospel. No, we're, we're bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the best news ever that we can have a relationship with God again and he, he can fix that and we can have peace with him when we turn away from our own ways and turn to him. Listen, Freedom Church, we know this. Freedom Church is on mission to what? To reach the lost and to disciple the found, right? I think we can do a little bit better than that. Ready? Freedom Church is on mission to reach, reach the, the lost and disciple, disciple the found. We're here to reach and to teach. These are the two pillars of the church that Jesus built on himself, the foundation, to evangelize and to disciple. That's what we're called to do. We're called to reach people with, for Jesus and to teach people about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Teach them his instructions and all of his ways. That's what he's called us to do. These are our functions. Okay? And, and so, Jenny, what are, what is the church not really called to be or to do? Uh, a social club. We're not called to be a social club. It's great to have relationships. Beautiful to have relationships. But if that's kind of our highest Standard. If that's what we're coming to church for, is just, just, just to have relationships, just kind of be social, have social friendships and all that kind of stuff, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it because there's a greater mission. What else? Uh, an extracurricular activities organization. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're not called to be an extracurricular activity. We're not called to be just a building, yeah. right? We're called to be people that are called out into the world sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Listen, when our vision is off, our mission becomes off. We can't ever let our vision be off, and our vision is freedom. We believe Jesus is 100% freedom. Galatians 5, 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to that old life that wants to keep you in bondage. Freedom Church's vision is to see lives set free and stay free in Jesus. We want to see freedom. We want to see transformational ministry, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to change somebody's life. 
There's a lot of things that we feel like in this world that, oh my goodness, look where things are at. Look, look, look at the state of humanity. Is anything, can anything change it? Yes, Jesus and his gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Amen. We want to be a people that see freedom. We want to see a people forgiving rather than living in their offense. Only a couple of us. All right. We want to see marriages and families reflect the heart of God and live peaceable and godly lifestyles in Jesus' name. We, that's right. Oh, come on, somebody. Now you're going to get going. All right. We want to see people living with hope and confidence over the anxiety and depression of this world in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to see the power of addiction broken and the wholeness restored in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to see hearts that are generous and compassionate winning over the entitlement mentality and self-centeredness of this world in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to see those who are stranded in sin overcome it and walk in victory and freedom in Jesus' name. We want to see the miraculous hand of God to deliver over the endless burdens of human reasoning in Jesus' name. We want to see people rescued from darkness and brought into the kingdom of his marvelous light in Jesus' name. Listen, God is not done yet. Look at somebody and say, God ain't done yet. <laughs> Amen. He is never finished going after what he set out to accomplish in this world. He's not done yet. So listen, if it happens to be the last of these last days, then guess what? These words from Joel the prophet, echoed by Peter, really apply. He said, in the last, actually, Jenny, why don't you read this? And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Amen. I'm not sure what I am right now, if I'm young or if I'm old, so I'm just going to have dreams and visions. Come on. God is still pouring out his spirit today. That has not stopped. He is still communicating. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's still giving dreams, and he's still giving vision. And we have to be a people that tune our ears into what the spirit is saying for this day. Amen? Amen. Listen, just over 100 years ago, in 1922, an 18-year-old guy from Minnesota named Ralph Samuelson went to a lumber yard to find two ordinary eight-foot pine plank boards. You see, he had been, <laughs> he had been pondering. Get it, get it from my bro Adam over there, right? He had been pondering whether or not a person could ski on water like he could ski on snow. Anyone else would go into a lumberyard and just see pine boards. But he saw water skis. You see, initially Samuelson convinced his brother to pull him around behind his boat in water on snow skis. But that was unsuccessful. He needed something that would cover more surface area, and that's where the pine boards came into play. Using his mom's boiler, he softened the ends and he curved them upwards. He then put leather straps on for his feet so that he could, he could stand on those and then not fall off. And he also hired a blacksmith to, to make a small ring for the, rope, the rope's handle that he'd be holding on to. Early attempts failed as he started his skis level with the water line. That just caused him to sink. But finally, he figured out kind of a new solution where he would lean back, sit his butt down into the water, and he would lean backwards as the, as the boat started to, to, to run. He would come up out of the water, and guess what? For the very first time, he water skied. The inventor of water skiing. Anybody water ski out there? It's a pretty fun thing to do, except for when you land on your face. But anyways... Maybe or maybe I've not done that. But Samuelson, he was skiing on water. It became quite the interest where up to crowds up to a thousand people would actually come out to see him water ski and do tricks. It all started with him looking at two pine boards differently. God's vision is always different than man's. And he always has a way of looking at things differently. But the end result seems to be floating and not sinking. See, God 
is giving us fresh vision. And as an eldership, we have been seeking God not only in this season, but for the better part of a, of a couple of years now, asking for God's vision for the church going ahead. And we simply want to share what we, the elders, the staff, Jenny and I, believe God is speaking to us. We have a vision and we're dreaming dreams of what God wants to do. So let's start with our first dream. Dream number one is that of a greater reach into the world. And so how are we doing that, Jenny? We're going to reshape our missions um, to have a local and a global impact, which we've been doing. But um, we want to make sure that we don't drift. We cannot drift from the call of Jesus Christ to go into all the world preaching the good news and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We cannot get complacent in the comforts of these four walls because there's a lost and dying world out there. Um, we have a team that's been meeting regularly. Um, just recently, we formed and reforged a, a missions team. Uh, we've been gathering together to pray and to rebuild. We currently support as a church over 30 missionaries from local organizations to across, that's, that's huge, across, across the seas nationally and then globally. We've launched um, a new missions board in the lobby out there. So um, Mike Peacock, Mary um, Schneider, and Bill Honecker all worked very hard on handcrafting that missions board out there. Um, they're amazing people. Um, so you're going to be able to connect your eyes to the heart of where these missionaries serve. You're going to be able to see right where they are and also how we can we can serve. What can you do to be part of that mission? We're sending a team in January to Mexico. Who's on that team? Raise your hand. Who's on that team to Mexico? We're going to be sending a team to Mexico to help build a school and be an encouragement to missionaries that we support there, the Snyders. We've been supporting them for a very, very long time. And then next week, we have Alex and Jody joining us. Um, they lead something called the Gateway Project, which forms and plants apostolic teams in the most strategic cities on the planet. You're not going to want to miss them being here. Um, Jesus said that the fields are ready for the harvest. They're white. They're, they're ready. They are so ready. There's people, and it's the people in the fields that are ready, right, to come to know him. But has anybody just, like, opened up their front door ever and dinner just blew in through the door and was set right on the table? No? Nope. It hasn't happened yet. Um, I'm not talking about, like, DoorDash. Like, I mean, that's nice. But it has to be harvested, the fields are ready, but they have to be harvested. We have to go. You have to talk to somebody. You have to tell them about Jesus and what he's done in your life because they are dying. You have to go, and you have to share who Jesus is to you to this lost and dying world. We've got to move. We've got to be ready. So we are so excited to see the Holy Spirit build um, the momentum on this one. Amen. And, and a, couple just, a couple things. This, this just excites me. We, we just... We just signed on with a, a couple um, that actually, uh, their base is in Poland. And, and they go out to several other countries um, to be a support, and they kind of oversee different missionaries, and they help them uh, with just different media and getting the word out of what they're doing. Now, I just want to mention this. This, this, this group um, that they're a part of, uh, in 52 nations, 29 29 of the nations out of the 52 that they serve are less evangelized than North Korea. Come on. Wow. We're, we're, we want to support people that are going into the world and sharing the gospel with people that have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on. Wow. That's amazing. Next spring, um, we are actually partnering with Compassion International. Um, it's an organization that, that helps um, kids in, in poverty in, with education and, and Christian discipleship. And, and we're going to have uh, just an awesome partnership. Uh, we're going to have a season of that next year. God is, is moving us to greater connection uh, regionally, locally, as well as globally to spread the gospel in the world today. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Our dream number two... Dream number two is that we would participate in a greater way through more regional partnership and good deeds that would glorify our Father in heaven. One way that we hope to do this is by a greater opportunity to partner with Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. Who knows that? 
We're a part of it. We've done it for years. And we've been a part of this initiative of collecting shoeboxes and filling them with toys and, and different supplies that were then shipped to over 170 countries around the world. Well, this year, we are officially now a drop-off location for the greater Buffalo Niagara region. And this means that our church, yeah, come on. Well, it means that our church will be a local hub for shoebox collection. Community members, organizations, other churches will begin to, to drop their churches off and will help with some of the logistics of all of that here at our church. Last year, uh, through the Operation Christmas Child Initiative, we, we helped along with everybody else who does this, uh, help collect over 11 million shoeboxes. That's 11 million is. And this year we hope to smash that number. Come on, somebody, right? It's good. Amen. Amen. So good. As we continue to move on, we have more vision too. And our next dream, our third dream is, um, really, if you haven't noticed, um, we've been growing, haven't we? Would you, would you agree? Are you doing the kind of, yeah? Praise God for that. Um, you know, it's really a blessing to see our North Campus grow too. Um, it, that campus is, was pretty full itself this morning as well. And so what that means is it's, it's a beautiful thing that, that God is, is, is growing our church and growing the mission. And we're able to reach more people for Jesus. That's like what we're trying to do. And so that also then also means that, that we've got we to figure out what we've got to do with, with, with the growth. <laughs> and so in 2025, we also are, are planning on uh, moving to another service as well. So that we can, we can share the gospel and teach and reach in, in, in a greater way. So can we give God praise for that as well? There's no doubt about it. Sometimes growth comes with challenges, and, and they're not bad challenges, but there's been many times in this sanctuary alone where it's been overpacked out. There have been times where we've not been able to accommodate even those coming to our services. Um, and and, and that's, that's crazy to think of, but we're not trying to apply church growth principles. I'm not, I'm not really about that. Actually, we're trying to, to live out church health principles because I believe that healthy things just grow. And our desire and our dream is that we are healthy disciples who make disciples. Church is not enough to come just to receive, to receive a message, maybe receive a ministry. Oh, I want to come to church because I want to do this. Well, that's great. But how are you multiplying the kingdom of God? How are you doing that? It's not for the church and this building or us or eldership or the staff team or, or other people that, that are really plugged in just to, to, do, to, to grow the kingdom of God. It's all of our, our job. We want, we've got a message to give. And the last one that we want to share with you this morning, and this is something that we've been praying into for years actually, our fourth dream. It's a big dream. We have a dream to build what we're calling the Freedom Church Hope Center, right out back here. Come on. Now let me tell you what that is before, before you go ahead and clap, all right? No, I'm just kidding. But the Hope Center is going to be a multi-purpose building that will give hope to our community by providing life-giving resources, developmental opportunities, athletic ministry programming, and genuine care and compassion to the greater Niagara region, all in the name of Jesus. Listen, come on. It's all rooted and grounded in the gospel of Christ. And we want to be a church that cares for the one that's left on the side of the road. We want to be a church that helps to shape the young people of today into leaders of tomorrow. We want to be a church that provides opportunity for people to grow in character and leadership and teamwork through athletic programming. We want to be a church that contributes to developing life skills that further enhance the quality of people's life. We want to be a church that offers hope in these times that we live in. Listen, they told Nehemiah that, they, that he couldn't build that, that wall to protect Jerusalem. But he saw those walls built in 52 days. Noah was laughed at and mocked for building an ark. 
that was the only means of salvation for a lost and dying world. And Jesus, he built his kingdom. He was mocked when he said, I'll, be, I'll raise this temple up. And guess what? He raised his own temple up in three days. And he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, this facility, this Hope Center, it's going to have several extra classrooms, an outside amphitheater, and a gymnasium. That's our hope. If you didn't know, our Wednesday night young life that's going on here at the church, Adventure Kids and Nexus Youth Ministry, they're kind of busting at the seams. Like the youth sanctuary simply can't hold all the teenagers. Can I get a praise God for that? Our rockin' youth team and Lou are just making it happen. It's just phenomenal to see the passion in these kids. And the adventure kids, they've got to find space next door at the school to facilitate what they need for these young ones. Not to mention our Freedom Church Homeschool Co-op is limited right now only because of space. We had to close down the wait list because we just, we don't have any more room because families are, 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 are finding hope in, 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 in what we're doing here as a church. God is doing so much, and yet this world needs hope. Our community needs hope, and we want to be an avenue of which where they can find it. Because I'll tell you right now, many are deceived and putting their hope in all the wrong things, and it only leads to greater depression, anxiety, addiction, and all of that. If you're going to dream big, listen, you got to start small, and you got to think hard. So for the last couple of years, the elders and I, we've been praying, we've been thinking, and we've been starting small. We certainly don't have everything all figured out, but this is the first step to share the vision of the church and share our vision of this Hope Center. By the way, did we put a picture up of it yet? Oh, there it is. Awesome. <laughs> We're going to have a whole presentation table out in the back too after baptisms as well that people can check out and see. There's going to be some elders there that are also going to be available just to answer any questions. Again, we're sharing the vision today. It doesn't mean that this is happening tomorrow or anything like that. There, there's plans and everything that, that are being, being made, and we want, we, want, we want inside, we want people to be a part of this. We want to be a part of a, of a body of Christ that's offering hope unto all the world. We're going to be unpacking these, these things in more details in the months to come, but right now, the biggest thing that we ask for people to do is what? Pray. Tell them that. Pray. <laughs> Don't tell me that. I know, what it, I know what the answer is. I wrote it. So it does. Uh, <laughs> but nothing, nothing happens if we don't pray. Pray. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just simply asking that you would pray into this vision with us. Um, because because it, it, it's got to be all of us in that way. We want to give a, a new view to the world, not, 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 a, not, a, not just a new view for them to see Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's up to us in this generation to be witnesses of him. So these are exciting times. God's calling us to take care of, of what's possible, and he's going to take care of what's impossible. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's a new starting line in the season of this, this life that God's calling us to. And as we, as we wait for that ready, set, go at that starting line, I don't think that's going to be what's going to be shouted. I think it's going to be ready, set, God. Because he's not done yet. Come on, somebody. Can everybody say ready, set, God? You guys say it? Ready, set, God? We got to do that better. Ready, one, two, three. Ready, set, God. All right. Listen, he's still giving dreams. He's still giving vision. He's still speaking. But are we listening? I believe God gives us a new starting line all the time, actually. But are we always willing to line up at that starting line? He gives us new experiences and opportunities for the vision of our lives. But too often we're fixated on what we think we already know. And so at that, we want to offer... We want to offer hope, freedom, and vision in that way. This time I'm going to go into a small message before we get into baptism. It's going to be brief, but uh, can you give it up for my wife? Yeah. Yeah. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 5. And there's a story here that I want to share this morning. And it says, on one occasion while the crowd 
was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they, let every, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is a story where Peter gets a new starting line. Jesus gives the commands, ready, set, God. Will Peter run? Will he respond? Jesus is amazing because he has the ability to use anything and anybody. And I love that about him. And in this story, he uses the fishermen's nets in a profound way. You see, the fishermen, they're on shore, as it says, washing their nets. In Mark's gospel, it says they're mending their nets. They're cleaning the nets. They're, they're fixing them. It's really the same difference. But these fishermen, Peter and his brother Andrew, are cleaning up for the day. And by the way, it was a very unsuccessful day. A day to be discouraged about. They got no fish, nothing, zero zilch. Has anybody had those types of days? Where you go, you put all the work in and all you feel like, what did I even do today? You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's, those aren't fun days. And listen, sometimes those days, though, they, they accomplish nothing. But just maybe in the days that feel like they accomplish nothing, maybe it's a day where God can accomplish anything. Notice what Peter and his brother did not do. After their unsuccessful day where they were no doubt pretty discouraged about and probably sick and tired of fishing at this point, they did not leave their stuff dirty. They did not leave discouraged and depressed. No, they cleaned their nets. They repaired where their nets needed to be repaired. They didn't have the attitude, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. No, 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 they, they did something. They took care of what needed to be taken care of. Listen, there's times in our lives where we need to do some mending. We don't always want to, but we have to. It might feel like a necessary evil sometimes to work on some things in your life rather than trying to catch the success or catch what you want. But guess what? If you don't mend, you're not going to be able to catch the miracle. If you don't mend, you're not going to be able to catch the vision. So the reality is that those unproductive times of mending the nets will eventually lead to productive times of catching the fish. I'm completely convinced that in this narrative, that Peter, if he was not mending his nets, Jesus would not have called him to greater significance. You want to know why? Because if Peter's net was unusable, if it was too dirty, or if it, if it was too, 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 the nets were fraying too much, need of too much repair, then do you think that Jesus would have said, go out and throw your net on the water to collect this large catch of fish where that net would have probably broken. Probably not. Jesus wouldn't have done that. See, his net would not have been able to sustain the catch. Listen, God will never, ever, ever call you to something that your nets are not ready for. 
So don't ever forget to mend the net. And what I want you to know today is this. It's my job, it's your job to mend the net. It's God's job to make the miracle. It's my job to do the possible. It's God's job to do the impossible. I can't make God do anything. But I can set myself up by mending my net, can I? Peter mended his nets. Because he was faithful to take care of what God had given him, God gave him a greater opportunity. And I'm not talking about a greater catch of fish. I'm talking about a greater vision for his life. God gave him an opportunity to catch a miracle. He gave him an opportunity to catch a vision. But notice he was faithful to mend his nets. He put himself in a place that Jesus could use him. Simply because Peter did what he was supposed to do. It's your job to mend the net, and it's God's job to make the miracle. Now, Peter didn't know what Jesus was about to give him. He didn't know that Jesus was going to give him a greater vision for his life. You see, Peter's vision for his life at this point was to simply make enough to provide for his family. Peter's vision was to wake up every day, go catch fish for a living. His vision was to maybe get a little extra. It wasn't a bad vision. But according to Jesus... It was an incomplete vision. Because sometimes our visions can be incomplete in life, and and sometimes we confuse our vision for an idea. But a vision, it's more than an idea. A vision is something that is the dominant cause that governs your life. It determines your decisions. It's what you think about and where your mind gravitates towards no matter what you are doing. A vision actually determines the relationships that you surround yourself with. It's what you pray about. It's what you give yourself to. It's what you give your resources to. You live your life. You spend your life for the vision that God gives you. Peter, he didn't have a vision like that of which I just described. So Jesus brought him on a little fishing excursion to find his God-given why. And Jesus wants to do that for all of us. He wants you to find your God-given why. God will bring you on that excursion if you're faithful to mend the nets. If you're faithful to steward what he has already given to you, God says in his word that he'll he'll actually give you some more. This is so important to God. Because the God-given why is what Jesus himself lived out. You remember when he went back to Nazareth and he opened up the synagogue, or he opened up the scroll in the synagogue and it right to Isaiah, and he, he read these words and he said his God given why was here to the Spirit of God was anointing him to preach the good news of the gospel to the poor, to liberate the captive. All Jesus could see was his mission to seek and to save the lost. Other Bible Bible people, too, like Paul. Paul had a great vision. He saw this world in need of a Savior, and so his vision was that he felt obligated to preach the gospel. So much so that, that what he would do, all that he could do, was to influence people for the name of Jesus. He became all things to all people, he said, in order to reach some. Start with your why. It's your cause of action. What drives you? For the church, our drive ultimately is Jesus, but Jesus causes us to see people, lives, not numbers, people, names, souls, destinies, hope. We want to see freedom in the lives of people. And I think for Peter, he probably had a holy discontentment. Maybe he wasn't so holy in his life yet. He was probably good at fishing, he was decent enough to make a living, but he knew that there was something more for him. So he tended his nets until the more found him. You see, Peter lived out a faith in advance simply by mending his nets so that he could have a faith in the moment and say, yeah, Jesus, I'm ready. I I guess I could do this even though I don't really want to because I've been fishing all day. He was ready even if he didn't want to be. Now, I don't think Peter was fully understanding about what was about to happen. In fact, I know he wasn't. He told Jesus, I really don't want to go out there, but I'll do it because you said it. 
When's the last time that you simply listened to God because he said it? Instead of looking for a hundred confirmations. And I'm not talking about I feel the Lord's telling me to do this or that. I've got a lot of feelings out there all the time. If God says it, we should do it. If you want to have a vision from God in your life, you have to be willing to be obedient even when it's not convenient. And it was not convenient for Peter that day. It wasn't convenient. You know the day. Like, you don't want to do one more thing. And especially, you don't want to listen to somebody else trying to tell you how to do your job. Anybody? Anybody go to the workplace and you got somebody that, that, that doesn't even know how to do what you're supposed to be doing for your job. And there might be an issue or a problem. And, and, and they, they think it's their job to tell you that this is what you need to do. Right? Don't you love those people? It's a wonderful exercise of love. The love of Jesus in those moments. Right? Right. Or wrong. All right. Whatever. Be a disciple of Jesus and love him anyways. All right? But listen, it was not convenient for Peter. He had already been in the water. Entire night. He was tired. He was hungry. He, 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 but he said yes. The next part of catching a vision for your life is do what Peter did. Cast your hope in the word. Don't cast your hope on a situation or a person. Cast it in the word. Peter's hope wasn't an emotional excitement. It wasn't wishful thinking. It wasn't an overestimated consideration of himself even in this moment. His hope was not based on what he thought he might get. It was quite literally based on who Jesus was. His hope was in Jesus. He said, because you have said this to me, I'll do it. But Peter didn't have any hope in the situation or what he could gain from it. He already thought that this was a waste of time. His hope solely was in the word of God, Jesus Christ, and Jesus the word speaking the word. Can I ask you, what is your hope fixed on these days? Is it fixed on the next president? Is it fixed on the government? Is it based on the economy? Let's get more personal. Is it based on a relationship? Is it based on your spouse? Or maybe even the dreams that you have for your kid? You see, when we put our hope in anything other than Jesus, the condition of our soul will ebb and flow with the circumstances of life. David asked this question of himself a couple times. He said, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Why was his soul downcast? It was because his hope wasn't being placed in God. He told himself to hope again in God. His soul was cast down and in turmoil because he placed his hope in other things. Maybe it was good things. Maybe it was in how successful he could be. Maybe his hope was placed in his financial accounts. I don't know. Maybe it was placed in a person that let him down. I don't know what his hope was exactly, but his hope was placed in the wrong spot. You got to put your hope back in the word. Putting your hope anywhere else will only lead you to a life that perishes. It will only lead you to the winds and the waves that will bring you here and there. Hebrews 6.19 says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. A hope that is anchored in Christ is a life that will not drift away. An anchor was a symbol of hope in the ancient world. Why? Because when a storm came, the boat may go up and down on the waves, but it won't be able to be cast out to sea. And listen, you don't need an anchor when things are calm. Only when things are rough. For Peter, things were pretty rough. No fish equal no business. No business equal no provision. But yet, hope himself gave him an opportunity for a new starting point. And what happened? Peter threw his mended nets over. And those nets that he had mended were now filling up with so much fish 
that he had to have his business partners come over with their boat. Peter mended. God miracled. Peter caught a miracle that day. How? Well, was it wasn't because he demanded it from God, that he twisted God's arm. No, God led him right into it. But he had to have those nets to catch it. He was first faithful to mend those nets. Next, he listened to Jesus' word. And when Peter saw the power of Jesus that day, he was confronted with the same reality Isaiah had in the throne room of God. Isaiah said, woe is me. Peter said, woe is me, I'm a sinful man. He realized the vision that he was living for his life was missing the target of God. He realized that his life was full of his own pride and independence. And these were all very good things for him to realize. But Jesus, he gave him a new perspective even in the misunderstanding that he had of his condition. Which brings us to the last part of catching God's vision for your life. Jesus also affords us the opportunity to see the you through God's view. To see you through God's view. All Peter could see was his sinfulness. And Jesus would help him overcome that for sure. He doesn't allow us to not be transformed if we truly follow him. But Jesus saw not a fisherman, but an evangelist. Someone who would not be catching fish, but would be catching people for the kingdom of God. Catching Jesus' vision will bring you to a place where you will have to see through, you, you'll have to see you through God's view, not your view. Good Lord, I don't always like the view that I see me. I see my own life in. Because often I see a view that maybe I'm tired of or sick of or that I don't always like. But Jesus gives us a new view. A new view of ourselves in Christ Jesus. There's an article that was, was listed in, in a newspaper and talked about researchers believe that the 17th century Dutch master Rembrandt may actually have had a vision condition that oddly enough contributed to his success. After analyzing 36 of his uh, self-portraits, experts concluded that his, this renowned painter may have suffered from strabismus condition. This involved the misalignment of one eye so that it points in an outward direction, more commonly known as wall eye. One eye would be focused, the other one would be off to the side. Rembrandt's paintings exhibit skill in using light to carry perspective. A misalignment of his eyes would have left the painter with no depth perception, giving him an advantage in the task of translating three-dimensional scenes into two-dimensional scenes. Pretty amazing. Pretty phenomenal. And so Harvard Medical School neurobiologist Margaret Livingston observed it illustrates that disabilities are not always disabilities. They may be assets in another realm. And listen, Jesus with Peter that day, Peter saw all of his disability. He saw his true condition. He saw how he really was. He saw how messed up he really was in life. But Jesus, he had a different view of Peter. He had a new view of Peter. He had a view, not a fisherman, but an evangelist. Somebody that would lead this early church movement to expand the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jesus showed Peter a new view of leadership, of a man who would share with others the gospel of Jesus Christ. A man that just three years later would preach the southern steps of Jerusalem and see 3,000 people come to know Jesus Christ that day. You see, in that three-year period of time, Jesus did what Peter was doing when Peter called him out on the, or when Jesus called him out on the water. See, Peter, he mended the nets. But Jesus, in that time period, he was mending Peter's soul. He was washing it, repairing it, getting him ready. And listen, you'll never get God's vision for your own life if you don't allow him 
to mend your soul, to wash you from this world, from all the mindsets, all the conditions, all the stuff that's out there. Never, never be able to use you in that way if you don't allow Jesus to start mending in your life. God wants to do that. He wants us to be a church that allows him to work and move and wash us clean so that we can be vessels put to good use. That's what the scriptures say. And so today, if you want to be that kind of vessel, if you want to be that kind of net that Jesus can use after he washes and mends, so that you have a vision to catch all that God has coming to you, I want you to stand just in faith today for a new vision in this place, a new vision for your life. And I just simply want to ask you to respond to God with the word yes. Yes, I will. Yes, I will give my life to you again. Yes, I will allow you to use my life as a net bring people in for the glory of his name.